This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. It's uh, very easy when uh, we start to think about uh, the economic situation to get uh, uh, very pessimistic, to get uh, overwhelmed, as it were, with the idea that there are no alternatives. Uh, Margaret Thatcher's <coughs> famous phrase, uh, Tina, there is no alternative, uh, hangs over us uh, all of the time. But I want to start to uh, open a pathway towards a discussion of alternatives, and not by myself necessarily proposing something which is a radical departure, but by taking up uh, some of the questions which are currently being posed uh, within the field of uh, economic theory and actually more generally in society as, as a whole. And the point here, uh, starting point here, is let us talk a little bit about the nature of value and what value is about and how we understand a term like value. And in recent times, there has been a reemergence of an interest in that question. And there is a book by Mariana Mazzucato, which is called The Value of Everything. And it's an attempt to introduce the question of how do we value things into the field of economic theory. Now, the question of value actually in economic theory goes back a long way. It was a really hot topic amongst the classical economists like Adam Smith and Ricardo and the like. And at that time, there was a general drift towards what was called the labor theory of value, saying that the value of commodities is fixed by uh, the labor which is congealed within them and that therefore uh, there is a labor theory of value which, which underpins uh, price formation. And so this idea was uh, quite strong uh, in the classical period. It ran into certain moral dilemmas, however, because uh, it became clear that if labor was at the origin of value, then there was an issue because the laborers who created the value were receiving very little of it. And this seemed to be morally wrong, if not uh, a, a bit absurd, that those who created the value should have so little of it, and those who didn't create the value uh, took all of it. Uh, and th this led uh, to a certain kind of interest uh, saying, well, uh, there should be mechanisms set up whereby the laborers should receive a goodly part of the value which they themselves created. And, of course, this was in part the sort of philosophy that under, underpinned uh, some utopian uh, attempts during the early 19th century. One thinks of uh, Robert Owen, for example, who took the view that, uh, yes, workers uh, deserved uh, to, to gain back uh, much of the value which they themselves produced, and uh, Robert Owen's attempts to create uh, forms of organization that allowed that to happen were, were significant. Uh, other economists of that time, uh, the Ricardian socialists, for example, and somebody like John Stuart Mill, took the view that, well, maybe you couldn't uh, reorganize production, but maybe you could set up redistributive mechanisms whereby some of the value which is produced and which was flowing around in society could be redirected, perhaps by state interventions and the like, so that uh, working populations uh, received far more of the value which they themselves created. So the value theory uh, at that time was uh, contained a whole set of technical dilemmas and at the same time a whole set of moral dilemmas uh, and there was therefore a serious debate uh, on the labor theory of value and the significance of the labor theory of value. Uh, 
This, uh, in a sense, got terminated uh, in, from the middle of the 19th century onwards by a general drift away from any kind of allegiance to the labor theory of value and saying that value was actually created uh, in, in, or the measure of value was uh, arrived at by a very different uh, mechanism, very different means. And uh, in a sense, uh, uh, value was fixed uh, by people's choices, by people's desires and wants and needs. And so it was fixed uh, in the market so that there was an abandonment of uh, the idea that value underpinned price to the idea that actually price determined value. And so that if something was of a high price, then it obviously was of high value. And therefore, uh, the debate about uh, who should get what uh, would disappear because the market uh, would take uh, care of uh, that, uh, that problem. Now, this has raised sort of questions today. Uh, and and uh, in this uh, book by Mariana Masicato, she puts it this way. I read it to you. If bankers, estate agents, and bookmakers claim to create value rather than extract it, mainstream economics offers no basis on which to challenge them, even though the public might view their claims with skepticism. Who can gainsay Lloyd Blankfein when he declares that Goldman Sachs employees are among the most productive in the world? Or when pharmaceutical companies argue that the exorbitantly high price of one of their drugs is due to the value it produces. Government officials can become convinced or captured by stories about wealth creation, as was recently evidenced by the US government's approval of a leukemia drug treatment of half a million dollars, precisely using the value-based pricing model pitched by the industry, even when the taxpayer contributed $200 million towards its discovery. So the analysis of value, says Matsukato, has all sorts of implications. Uh, Adam Smith looked on bankers as if they were unproductive. Essentially said they're parasites who kind of live off the value created by others. I mean, bankers, uh, if you have a labor theory of value, it's hard to see how bankers can be producing value. And actually, uh, Matsukato uh, tells me something that I really didn't know, that before the 1970s, uh, financial services were not included in the calculation of gross domestic product. In other words, they were considered as add adding nothing uh, to the total value of gross domestic product. Only after 1970 did they get included, and now, of course, uh, they're considered to be uh, of uh, great value producers. So, do financiers produce value? This starts to become a very important kind of question. And right now in Britain, for example, it's become a huge question because since the 1960s onwards, Britain has attached its economy in many ways to the activities of the city of London. And the city of London uh, doesn't produce value in the classical kind of sense, but it produces value in the sense that its financial services become critical for the economy. So the growth of financial services in London has really underpinned the whole position of the British economy. And it is clear that from the 1960s onwards, public policy in Britain was attached to protecting the financial services as the productive center and productive core of the British economy against other forms of activity. So, for example, in the 19, as early as the 1960s, when faced with a problem of the value of the pound sterling, the only thing the government could do was to raise the interest rates. And if you raise the interest rates, then this, what this does is to improve the value of the pound sterling and protect the, the pound sterling against speculation in international markets. And so in protecting the pound sterling by raising the interest rates, however, you put a burden on British industry. In other words, British industry suffered in a double sense that first, its debt payments were now higher, but secondly, also a strong pound made exports much harder to procure because the value of the pound was high and that therefore uh, the value of British goods was priced out of, of, of international markets. So the public policy over the interest rate was geared to protecting 
the, 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 the city of London as opposed to protecting British industry. So British industry tended to decline in waves and in phases from the 1960s onwards because the, the city of London was being favoured. Now, we've now got a situation where Britain decided in a referendum that they were going to leave the European Union. Uh, this then raises the question, if uh, you leave the European Union, what happens to the city of London? Do you protect the city of London? Or do all of the financial services go off to Frankfurt or Paris or Amsterdam or anything else? And in fact, it begins to look as if financial services are going to disappear from Britain. In which case, what was once the core of the British economy is going to be take a pretty hard knock from Brexit. And at the same time, the British economy has not done very well in terms of protecting its manufacturing base. So what is going to happen to the British economy in Brexit if its most productive sector, or supposedly most productive sector, uh, is going to go to, you know, dis disappear? So this is, but, but that rests on the assumption that the city of London is doing productive things and that, that therefore what the city of London does is productive of value uh, in the Lloyd Blankfein sense. But what happens if you kind of said, well, actually, Financial services are parasitic. They're parasitic on the real economy. And shouldn't we actually reconstruct the real economy in Britain? Uh, you know, so you can see where the debate might, might, might go and how difficult it might be. And this then kind of question is the big question. Are financial services productive of value? And if they are productive of value, then in what sense uh, can they be seen as productive? And in what ways ought public policy to cultivate financial services as opposed to abandon public services relative to what might be called the real economy? In other words, what's the relationship between Wall Street and Main Street, between the city of London uh, and, and, and uh, the sort of pathways in Manchester and, uh, uh, and, and Liverpool? So this is the, 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 the dilemma which currently exists. Now, in the midst of this, we're having a bit of a debate about how to value things in general in, in economic terms. For example, let us look at something like mergers and acquisitions. Firm A decides it's going to acquire firm B. How does it value firm B? Well, it'll add up all of its assets, uh, all its liabilities, and it will do a kind of a technical kind of job of that kind. But at the end of the day, it will also add in something, which is called goodwill. And now, exactly what is goodwill? Goodwill means that the reputation of the firm being acquired is such that the brand name is something. Let's suppose uh, you're acquiring something called uh, Nike, for example. Well, the brand name of Nike is hugely significant. Let's suppose you're uh, acquiring something called Yves Saint Laurent. Well, that has significance too because it has a certain cachet and uh, you know and 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 the like. So there comes a point where the value of a firm is its tangible assets and its material assets plus something which is immaterial. And the immateriality then is difficult to assess. How much is it worth in the market? How much is it worth to you to acquire a firm with a name brand like Nike or Yves Saint Laurent? Uh, and that then becomes a, a real, real difficulty. Uh, but it doesn't uh, actually deter anybody because along come the accountants, the famous uh, accountants who are supposedly expert on these kinds of things, and they put a number uh, on that. And they kind of say this is worth X million dollars or X, uh, you know, uh, but nobody knows exactly where that number comes from. But everybody believes the accountants because, you know, they're reputable accountants and uh, everybody, then the merger takes place and the goodwill is supposedly purchased for whatever figure it is. But then what happens afterwards when you find out, actually, there's not as much goodwill there as you thought there was? Well, we've seen several mergers and acquisitions which have gone very badly wrong over the past few years because uh, the goodwill was not really there and the goodwill turned out not to be worth as much as anybody thought. Uh, 
And this all then also says, at a certain point, at what, po at what point we say, you know, the goodwill is something which actually should be determined in the market. And I came across this a lot just recently by going back and looking at the value of housing. Now, the value of housing is very interesting. Now, you can look at it and say, how much does it take to build this house? And you can add up all of the costs and you can add the profit and all this kind of thing and say, well, so the house is worth you know, $20,000 or $200,000, say. But then it turns out that it's in a prime neighborhood and the value of the land is uh, quite high. So you say, well, actually, it's worth $100,000, $300,000 because the land is actually worth $100,000. But then you kind of say, but this is in a prime neighborhood and it has a name like Chelsea or it has a name like, like uh, you, you know, uh, uh, sort of the Upper West Side or the Upper East Side, or it has a, a telephone number which is uh, a much uh, highly regarded telephone number. So you add another hundred thousand onto the price of the house, and so the thing that actually cost, say, uh, two hundred thousand to build, ends up being worth five hundred thousand dollars because you've got all these extra things which are adding on in terms of its reputation. And actually, the housing market works that way a lot. Uh, and what we've seen in, in, in San Francisco and what we've seen in New York and all the rest of it is a lot of the value of the, of the housing is given by this reputational value, by, uh, by brand name value. And then there's an interesting kind of question which happened in 2007, 2008, when the housing market froze. At that point, you couldn't sell anything. And at that point, the actual sale value of house was zero because nobody would buy it for anything. So what happens under those circumstances when you go and, 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 and ask the question, what are the, what's the value of all of these mortgages which are sort of stacked away in the financial institutions or have been passed on to people in terms of collateralized debt obligations when actually... Uh, there's no market for those housing there. Well, I went and looked and asked what happened to all of the uh, housing which was held by Lehman Brothers or in Bear Stearns, and people put an arbitrary value on it. They kind of said, well, if the market revives, then these houses would be worth, if there was a market, so much, so and so and so and so much. And a lot of people put money on, you know, put money value on a house uh, which didn't actually exist because there was no market for it at that particular moment. Now, the market has revived since, and we've gone back, and you know, a lot of things have, have, have happened ever since. But at that moment, actually, the value of housing and the value of those mortgages was close to zero. Uh, now, what, what this is suggesting is that price and value are not the same thing, that therefore we need some better way to talk about value. And there's a way of talking about value which starts to actually argue that the value in the value price relation is a complicated relation and we need to revive some sort of questions about it because actually in the market right now, in mer mergers and acquisitions and in uh, the assessment of housing values and all the rest of it, we're seeing this arbitrary component, this immaterial component, which also carries over to commodities themselves because there is something called branding value. What's the value of the brand name? And if you can establish a brand name and get it to be, you know, sort of a certain brand, then you can actually charge a monopoly price for it. So that there's a lot going on in the market right now, which is about immaterial values, which have a, a, a sort of a resonance with the nature of the price. And this is, therefore means that even contemporary economics is working in a field where expectations values, expectations, and, and the like are actually the immaterial base, if you like, of a, of a materiality, which is uh, the market exchange process, and that therefore you cannot actually calculate prices simply on the basis of what it costs to, product, to produce a Nike shoe. Uh, 
of a Nike shoe, you know, I mean, how, how much of the, the value of a Nike shoe is actually uh, given in the market and how much of it is given by the amount of labor which is involved in its production and all of the production costs which can added be added up. This is actually then the big conundrum which contemporary economics is having to look at and is opening up that question of what and how is value constructed. Now, Marx, of course, had a lot to say about value theory, and I'm not going to go into that here, but what I want to do is to say that perfectly reasonably, people are asking, how come these things have a certain value? How come the value of a drug, it's, uh, Matsukuto kind of says here, the value of a drug is, is arbitrarily arrived at in terms of its value in terms of saving a life. How do you value a life? Uh, and the saving of a life. How do you say, therefore, this drug should be worth a million dollars a pill because it saves one life? Is that what a human life is worth? And so we've got these, these, these questions which are arising internal to the dynamics of contemporary capitalism. And I want to argue that that, that argument which is going on and which is beginning to be opened up into terms of how we value things and why we value things in the way we do, that that opens up a big arena of debate in which it seems to me an, an, an alternative to capitalist valuation schemas has to be arrived at because an alternative to, to traditional uh, valuation schemas has already opened up. It's already opened up in terms of brand name. It's opened up in terms of goodwill in, in uh, mergers and acquisitions. It's opened up in terms of what happens in the course of a crisis. It's opened up even in an area like housing, where, where the valuation of something uh, is arrived at by a very particular kind of process. And, and there are standard procedures where, uh, where housing value is uh, determined, but nevertheless, there's an arbitrary component, and we see immediately that the valuation put on a house in, in say, 2006 is completely different from the valuation that will be put upon it in 2009. And when that collapse of value occurs, uh, that then affects the price, and it means that if somebody's holding uh, a mortgage on that, uh, which is a certain kind of price and the price is not there, then you have a major crisis on your hands of valuation. So I want to argue that there's a crisis of valuation widespread in our society right now, and into that comes back, actually, the moral question that the Ricardian socialists were often uh, putting, that if value is produced in a certain kind of way, then why are the direct producers of that value not rewarded? Why, if value is not produced in financial services, if value is not produced by marketing gimmicks and, uh, and, and all the rest of it, if value is not produced by advertising and so on, if all of those are parasitic activities, then why are we not actually valuing the people who actually create the real things that we really need to survive at a decent, decent level of la living in contemporary times? In other words, this question is opening up. And it's, it's opening up where I think common sense looks at it and people kind of say commonsensically, look, I'm working very, very hard at, at producing X and I'm getting very little for it. And I am looking at a situation where you know, this person is 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 uh, you know making out like a bandit. You know the the, the Lloyd Blank finds of this world are making out like bandits uh, on the basis of an economy where they are actually parasitic as opposed to producing value. And what Matsukuto does is to say, look, we have this problem. And I'm going to read you uh, the, the 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 famous uh, quote that comes from. Uh, uh, from Big Bill Hayward, uh, founder of the United States' first industrial union. He says this, The barbarous gold barons, they did not find the gold, they did not mine the gold, they did not mill the gold, but by some weird alchemy, all the gold belonged to them. Now uh, that, it seems to me to be the problem which, you know, and Matsukuto is no raving radical. She's attempting to bring back 
uh, a debate on the value theory. And I, and I think this debate opens up the possibility for many people on the left to actually say, what is valuable in our society? What do we value? And how can we actually make sure that that value resides with those who are really creating it as opposed to those who are posturing as if they create it when really their activities are very parasitic? So we'll come back uh, to that and how Marx looked at that question uh, in a later session. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.